Welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. November marks the first anniversary of the Aviatrix Book Club Facebook group from which the Aviatrix Book Review website and podcast were born. My interviews so far this year have focused mainly on authors of books for adult readers, but as a writer for children and young adults on a mission to infiltrate the minds of young readers and inspire them to join us in aviation, I felt it was appropriate to widen my scope to books for younger readers. I'm thrilled to kick off the Young Aviatrix Readers series with an incredible guest whose story will appeal to listeners of any age, along with the author of a beautiful picture book about her adventures as the current record holder as the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. Her story is relevant in this moment in so many ways. This month, the Aviatrix Book Club is discussing the book, Open Skies, My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot about Niloufar Rahmani. In her book, Niloufar shares the story of her childhood, living as a refugee from Taliban rule in neighboring Pakistan and her journey back to her homeland to become Afghanistan's first female military fixed wing pilot. Today's guest is also Afghani, but she traveled a very different path to the sky, moving to the US as a refugee with her family when she was a child. With the events that we've witnessed since the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, we can appreciate even more how extraordinary her accomplishments are in contrast to what they might've been had her family remained in Afghanistan. The story is also timely because as I speak, another young woman is on a mission to break her record as the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. Her author is obviously drawn to this topic of record-setting women pilots. She's written six books for young readers, including Fly Girl Fly, which is the subject of today's discussion, and The Jerry Mock Story, the first woman to fly solo around the world. You can find my guests at their websites, dreamsoar.org and nancyropim.com, and on social media at Shasta Ways and Nancy Ropim. And be sure to check out the Aviate with Shasta podcast, which we'll talk about more in the interview. Shasta Ways and Nancy Ropim, welcome. Thank you for having us, Liz. That's, thanks, Liz. Good to be here. Well, I'm so excited to talk about this book with both of you um, and all of Shasta's adventures, of course. But I want to start by gushing a little bit about the book itself. Um, it's a beautiful book. The listeners may be thinking that this is a book for kids, so this will be a short interview. It will not, and trust me, it will be worth it for you. Um, there are those who think that writing for children is easier than writing for adults. Um, the books are shorter. Maybe people think that we're conveying simple concepts to uh, more simple readers. Um, but a, and a real writer writes full-length novels for adults. I'm sure any children's uh, book author has kind of felt that, uh, I don't know if that's disrespect, but that, that signal from readers or friends who don't know about the craft. And while those authors who write full-length novels um, are certainly real authors too, I am not sure that anything is as challenging <laughs> as writing big ideas in as few words as possible. Um, the jazz musician Charles Mingus said, making the simple complicated is commonplace, but making the complicated simple, amazingly simple, that's creativity. And conveying big concepts in, a, um, in poetry or in a children's book is very challenging. And this beautiful book really speaks to Nancy Rowe Pym's skill in that regard. And while she's not on the call today, I want to praise and acknowledge the illustrator, Alexandra Bai, because the illustrations in this book are gorgeous and perfectly paired with the text on the page. And if you have a young person in your life, get a copy of this book. You'll love reading it, and your children will be lost in the pictures, just as they should be while you read about Shasta's amazing story. So with that, um, Nancy, you and I are going to talk a lot more in depth in the second half of this interview about the craft of creating a beautiful book like this and your other work as well. But I would love it if you could start off by reading the first seven pages. Sure, I'd love to. 
has fly girl fly in a big big world was a small small girl who went by the name of shasta born in a refugee camp in afghanistan she did not remember when the soldiers came when the tanks rolled when the bombs dropped she had no memory of her family's escape or the plane ride to America. In California, Shasta's family grew and grew until she was one of six girls. They chatted in Farsi and Pashto, the languages of their homeland. At dinner time, they gathered around a cloth on the floor and ate, picnic style, from a spread of dishes. At home, Shasta lived as an Afghan, but in school, she learned to be American. One day, young Shasta said, I will do great things. Her mom said, you can do anything you set your mind to. Her daddy patted her head and said, but, but come my child, you are so shy. Her sisters giggled. You are afraid of everything, even planes in the sky. Well, apparently she's not, <laughs> as it turns out. Shasta, can you tell us a little bit about this part of your childhood, emigrating to the U.S., and how you were introduced to aviation? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the book captures it so well uh, in just a few pages and, and, and some illustrations, but um, yeah, I grew up in, in two worlds almost. Um, when my parents came to America, they left very abruptly. They, they left their home, their neighbors, everything that was home to them um, to seek refuge in America. And they were very grateful to be safe and all together. But they had this idea that they were going to go back someday and that they didn't want my sisters and I to get too comfortable in the American culture. So we are very Afghan at home. And then of course, when I would go to school, you know, I, I had American friends, we would all speak English. Um, so it was just me living in these two very different worlds. Um, so I always struggled with, you know, where do I belong? Uh, because some Afghans from Afghanistan think that I'm not Afghan enough. And Americans, being a really tan kid who, you know, English was my third language, I was never American enough. So um, I grew up, you know, just staying very close to what I knew. And for me, I saw my mom. Um, my dad worked most of our lives to support my five sisters and I. Um, and I saw my grandmother and they were both housewives um, and women generations before them were housewives. That's kind of the traditional role of what Afghani women um, uh, held. Uh, so I thought to myself, you know, that sounds like it's, you know, what I want to do. Um, so I, I kind of led my life with this idea that I would get married at a young age and have a family. Um, and although nothing is wrong with that. I, I just wasn't open to the opportunities that America was offering me, especially education. Um, so I, I was never a great student growing up. And um, sure enough, at age 17, I uh, flew uh, by myself. Uh, I say sometimes it's the first time, but the first time I actually ever flew was when I was a few months old, when my family came from Afghanistan. But I have no recollection of that flight. Um, so for me, 17 years old, getting ready, getting on board Delta Airlines, um, for me, that was kind of like my first real flight experience. And I was sitting in the back in a middle seat. And, you know, I grew up afraid of aviation because the only exposure that I had to it were usually aircraft accidents on the news. That's the only time I ever heard about airplanes. Um, and the... Sadly, um, the result of these accidents that were on the news were very catastrophic. So I just thought, you know, airplanes were dangerous and scary. So I had a lot of like tension going into this flight. Uh, I was flying from California to Florida. And sure enough, when the aircraft accelerated and we lifted off the ground and we started to elevate into the sky, it was just magical. Like, being able to look out the window and see the town that I grew up in and and see how small it was compared to you know what was around me it gave me perspective and 
um, I could feel all of that tense turn into curiosity. And at one point, I just remember looking out the window and I couldn't get enough of it. And, um, you know, I just thought to myself, I, I have a sense of belonging for the very first time. I don't know why I feel like I belong here um, in, in a very uplifting environment that's moving you forward to a new destination. Like all of that was just speaking to me. And the whole experience was so powerful that when I landed in Florida, my aunt picked me up and she said, you know, would you like to go to Disney World? Would you like to go to the famous beaches in Florida? And I, I told her, no, I want to stay at the airport and I want to figure out how to become a pilot. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. So that's kind of um, a short version of, of how I got into aviation and what my upbringing was like. That's, I, I love the passion that you convey in that because I think you know, all of us who fly feel it, but to be able to yeah. convey it that way and that first experience and that early romance with aviation, it's so <laughs> fun to hear you talk about it that way. And so how yeah. did you go from that curiosity to not many years later, I don't think, um, flying solo around the world? And how did your family bolster you for that experience? So. Um, I eventually, I found my way to my university, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I'm a dual alumna. Um, and, you know, as I was there, I kept thinking about what do I want to do with my flying career? And I had the opportunity to intern with a very big airline in America, a prominent airline uh, as a chief pilot intern. So I worked for the chief pilot. I got to jump seat on a lot of the trips. I got to sit inside with the pilots and see, you know, what that type of flying was like. Um, at one point, you know, I, I think I've always been fascinated by military aircraft, uh, just especially fighter jets. I just think they're so exciting and so cool. And what you're able to do with them in terms of performance and speed is, is really exciting. And so I went to Alaska to talk to the Air National Guard there about possibly joining. They were heavily recruiting. And I thought, wow, Alaska sounds like a really fun place to go. Um, and I spent some time there with the Air National Guard. And uh, so I had some exposure to what the military flying was like. And I knew a little bit about business aviation, but none of these three major areas excited me in terms of flying. And so, you know, I, I just put everything aside and I thought if I could do anything with flying, what would that look like? And, and I kept coming back to this um, conclusion that if I, you know, I'm a pilot, if I could fly an airplane around the world and share the message of believing in yourself, believing in your dreams and the things that give you a sense of purpose and belonging, um, that you need to pursue it because you really only have one life that's guaranteed for you. And then I remember one day thinking, well, what's stopping me from creating this job or this, this type of flying? Um, so with that, um, I started my own nonprofit and it, it actually took five years from like when I had the idea to then getting a team involved and sponsors and fundraising. We had, we were supposed to take off in 2016, but we delayed until 2017. So it took five years of really nurturing this idea of flying around the world um, for me to actually take off. So it really, the, the inspiration came from me wanting to just do something different that was meaningful, not that flying um, in, in different ways, like for the airlines or the military is not meaningful. It just, it didn't speak very strongly to me. So I, I kind of created that job description and I just went after it. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, there are so <laughs> many, so many ways we dream and we fantasize about the big things in the world that we might do. Right. And I can't imagine that very many people would be able to see through all of the reasons not to do that, yeah. <laughs> starting with financial reasons yeah. and then all oh, of the work to raise the money. That is so incredible. Oh, thank you. And, and very inspiring. And I, yeah. and I want to hear more about the trip in just a minute. But um, yeah. Nancy, you obviously are drawn to these women who fly solo around the world. I'd love to hear how you first learned about Jerry Mock 
the first woman to, to fly solo around the world, and then how, or if it did, how that led you to Shasta? Sure. Um, it was, I was just watching the news in my kitchen, cooking dinner, and they had about, the news was talking about the 50th anniversary of the first woman to fly solo around the world. And I was thinking, I went to commercial right after that, and I was like, 50, who is this? I was like, Amelia Earhart, and they're like, wait, Amelia disappeared. Like, she was the first you know, women aviatrix I could think of, but I'm like, wait, she disappeared. It can be her, like, who, who was the first? And I thought, why don't I, why don't I even, why don't I know this, you know? So I stayed and watched, and they said Jerry Mock. She was a housewife from Newark, Ohio, which was only an hour north of me. And I was just amazed. So I, I got to the computer and I Googled Jerry Mock and I found out more about her trip in 1964. And it was just, I just couldn't believe I had never heard of it. And she came right out of Columbus, Ohio. That's where she flew out of, like right in my neighborhood. So I called 411, not even sure if it worked anymore. Like I haven't tried this in it forever. And I just, I'm gonna get her phone number. And then when I'm done with my research, I'm gonna call her up. So I call 411 and I get directly connected to Jerry Mock. And all of a sudden Jerry's like, hello. And I'm like, is this Jerry Mock? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, Jerry Mock who flew around the world? And she's like, yes. <laughs> and now like, we're both laughing. And I go, oh my gosh. And I write children's books. I had nothing. I had no research done. And I'm like, I, I would love to tell your story. And, and she was like, oh, honey, I was just having a little fun in my plane. And then I thought I have to meet this woman. She was just so personable and so wonderful. And so she said to me, hey, do you want to just come out to Florida? Come to my house. And I said, okay. So I found Airbnb close by. I went to see Jerry, spent a few days with her and got the whole interview down. Um, and this was, um, let's see, 2014. And then she told me that a young lady had just come by and her name is Shasta Ways. And she said, she's an Afghan refugee. And she goes, and she wants to fly around the world. So we had a nice talk and she's like, and she's smart. I think she's going to do it. And so we talked about Shasta. And then um, I went to Oshkosh when the book came out in 2016 and I was doing a presentation on Jerry Mock because uh, I wanted more AV just to know about this amazing woman. And Shasta was there getting ready for her around the world trip with sponsors and everything. And so she interviewed me um, at Oshkosh and I gave her a copy of the Jerry Mock story and then Shasta said to me um, when I go to Columbus Ohio which is going to be part of my trip in honor of Jerry Mock will you be my host you know pick me up and help me out and I said I, I'd love to so that's how our relationship started um, at Oshkosh um, and then when she did come to Columbus I did pick her up and get her to her places she needed to be and um, then when she flew around the world she called me and said, will you tell my story? So that's how it all happened. <laughs> that is fantastic. What a great story. That's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. so Shasta, you, you took this trip. You talked about your goals. Did you, did you achieve the goals that you set out to achieve um, on your trip around the world? And can you tell us a little bit about your adventures? Yeah, so I think I went in it into it with two goals. Um, the number one being try to inspire as many children as possible to, to believe in their dreams and not let anything like their past challenges and their current circumstances guide where their dreams or their ambitions could go. And so that was always the heart of, of everything that I did. And, and actually, when I started the, the planning for the flight around the world, I had no idea who was the current record holder, You know, how many women had flown around the world. It really started with this notion that I want to go around the world and inspire people. And then later on, I realized that upon completing the trip, I would become the youngest woman uh, to fly solo around the world in a single engine aircraft. So that title came, it was like an afterthought. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. And then the second um, kind of goal going into the flight was to not, to, to be successful, you know, that it was like, I, I have to do this. I mean, so many people are paying attention. I have to be successful here. So those that were like a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like successful in the sense of like, make it around the world, you know, um, because I, you know, I felt like if I, if I didn't succeed in that sense, then I, it would just completely spoil the message that I was trying to share with people. Um, so that was just the two things that I, you know, had set up for myself goals going into it. Um, and, and it, and it far exceeded the actual trip. You know, it, it, it's like my, my 
brain had expanded in a way which in a very positive way. I mean, I, I went from a young girl from Afghanistan, grew up in California, very poor uh, with, with a big family, thinking to myself that I would never do anything great or accomplish anything to then, you know, so many years later, going around the world and seeing it for myself and having these perspectives and these moments in the aircraft that, you know, only came because of me doing this trip around the world and just meeting the people that I did. It just, it gave me perspective and insight and lessons that I think just shape who I am today. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I really am. Were there any moments in the trip where you were maybe fearful that it wasn't going to be successful or any, any moments when you were fearful, you know, being up there all alone? Um, I think there were several and, you know, I, there was never a moment where I felt like that fear completely diminished. Um, it was always there. And I think, um, I appreciated it because it allowed me to stay alert and focused that, you know, yes, I'm going around the world and I get to meet all these cool people, but you know, I, I, I'm flying single engine and a single engine, single pilot operation here. And the second I let my guard down, that's when, you know, things can, can go south. So um, the fear was always there and it, and it, I, I'm grateful for it, um, especially during the last, le- well, the last big leg of the trip, which was flying from Honolulu, Hawaii to California. It was a 14 and a half hour flight and three hours before reaching California, I was in the Bay area fog. That's so famous. Cause it's such, it's, it's like the thickest fog you could, you could ever imagine. And I'm very tired at this point because I had been up, um, you know, four hours before I took off and it was a lot of tension to do this overweight takeoff and kind of nurse the plane up with all this fuel to altitude, then fly. And three hours out from landing, I entered this very thick layer of fog and I was getting all sorts of like uh, illusions. And, you know, at one point I thought maybe... I'm not at altitude, like it it was just so quiet and I didn't have any sort of um, horizon or anything to look, to give me perspective outside of the aircraft. So I I kept looking at my instruments and, um, you know, it was tough. It was like, okay, I really need to stay awake and alert and, you know, three more hours to go. (laughs) But um, yeah, there, there were several moments where it was, it was a bit scary. Um, and there, there was one point at one time I took off from Thailand from Phuket flying to Singapore and to the left of me over Kuala Lumpur were two thunderstorms kind of merging together. And it was so strong that the airliners had all that heard. I mean, the airspace was just quiet. And then to my right-hand side, a volcano had erupted in Indonesia. And there I am flying, you know, in between these two, you know, mother nature, like huge things that are going on at a very low altitude and very slow. Um, And at one point, ATC, I think, realized that I was there in their airspace and they came on and they're like, what are you doing? Like, would you like vectors to go back to to Thailand? I mean, what, what are you doing here? And I was like, I can't go back because all of those clouds that I had dodged had had turned into a thunderstorm. You know, I can't go left because there's a huge cell to my left and I can't go right because of this volcano. So I have to fly forward. And, you know, it was, it was scary. I really thought like maybe that was going to be the last time that I would fly, but through some miracle, you know, there was this, this little triangle of like, clear weather and I could see the sun on the other side of this, you know, little triangle between like the thunderstorms and the the debris from the volcano. And I kept looking at it and I kept thinking to myself, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. And I was worried about fuel, but I was at full power just trying to get through all this weather. Um, And when I landed in Singapore, I just, I just like, 
I was all happy and smiley, but when I got to the hotel, I cried really hard. I thought to myself, that was probably one of the hardest legs of the trip, but I made it. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, there, but the fear, I welcomed it because it really kept me alert and awake. And um, it reminded me that, you know, this wasn't just a fun trip around the world, that this was serious. So yeah. Yeah, those are a couple of harrowing stories, honestly. Yeah. I've never had, I've had plenty of thunderstorm stories, but never thunderstorm and volcano yeah. <laughs> at the same so time. Bizarre. That is bizarre <laughs> and very challenging. And I flew for four years in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I absolutely know the fog because I was descending to the water through it on many missions, wow. but I was always dual pilot. And so I always had somebody backing me up on the instruments. Oh, and that wow. would also be, uh, you, yeah, I mean, you doubt yourself uh, even when you're with somebody, but you have somebody to ask, like, <laughs> what are you seeing? Are you seeing the same thing that I am? Yeah, that yeah. is incredible. It takes a lot of courage. Um, yeah. And so we have another courageous young lady, Zara Rutherford, who right now, as we speak, is on her journey. Um, and if she successfully completes the trip, she will ha be the new record holder. How are you feeling about that? And I know you've been in touch with her. How's she doing? She's good. You know, when I first spoke to her on the phone, one of the, the first things she asked me is she's like, is it okay that I'm going after your record? And I thought like, of course, Zara, like I wouldn't, I would be so sad if my, re you know, records are meant to be broken. And I'd be so sad if nobody else pursued a trip around the world and had these experiences, great experiences that I've had an impact on the world. I mean, this message is so strong to show that women can be successful pilots, they can do anything that they set their minds to. Um, and so, you know, I, I really embraced her as much as I could. And um, it was interesting because I had had a lot of great mentors, but I've also had people who tried to give me advice that was just counterproductive. So I, I kept all of those things in mind when trying to help Zara. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, she just, she's a very bright young girl. I, I can't believe she's so young. She's so mature. Um, and I'm following her along. She's doing great. She's stuck in Alaska right now. 19. Yeah. yeah. And you were how old when you did it? 29. And I completed the trip at 30. So there's like a 10 year difference here. 10 yeah. wow. years. Yeah. And so, you said she's stuck in Alaska right now? Yeah. She's stuck in Alaska. Uh, Nome, Alaska, and she's just waiting for the weather to clear up for her to continue on in her trip. But um, I commend her for 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 getting as far as to Alaska, and um, and she's just so bright, and I'm so proud of what she's doing. I really am. Nancy, I have to know. I have to ask you: Are you going to write about Zara? <laughs> well, she she wants me to write about. It. I'd love I'd love to. I'd be honored to. I mean, right now, I'm also talking to um, An Tu. She's a Vietnamese refugee who is flying around the world in, in May. And so we've been talking about writing a story, too. So there's lots of stories out there that yeah, I'd love to tell. Great. You're building but, a I mean, brand. I, I, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> she's, I mean, she's 19. I mean, she's so confident and determined. And uh, I say you know, more power to her. So and as far as being stuck in Alaska, I know Jerry Mock was stuck in Bermuda for a whole week. And Shasta, you were stuck due to weather and other issues. And some mechanical issues stop them. Weather stops them. There's all kinds of stuff. So it's just like any journey in life. I guess you have to just keep keep plugging on. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I can't imagine, you know, I remember, well, any given day, <laughs> any kind of delay for a flight, you know, you build up all this anticipation to go on any flight for me, an operational mission or a training mission um, when I was in the military. And so there's all this buildup, all this preparation, you're ready to go. I cannot imagine being on a multiple day delay for a trip mm -hmm. like this with the pressures that you're experiencing. Shasta, you wanna talk about what Zara might be experiencing right now in Alaska? Yeah, um, so I gave some advice to Zara, I, I told her, if you can rent a car and go explore because the waiting around will really get to you and you know you're stuck take the opportunity make the best of it it's almost good to get out of that bubble of like going to the airport and waiting around and you know talking to mechanics and just you know that 
being anxious like that. It's um, just not very productive energy. Um, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Liz. It, there is a lot of anticipation that goes into it. And, you know, for her, so many people are following her and watching her. So there's that aspect of it too. And, um, you know, I, I just told her to keep herself busy. And I, I remember, you know, I had three major weather delays and one, um, mechanical problem. And, uh, like after like the second weather delay, I just took a step back and I thought like, you know, I'm on this around the world mission. I, I'm delayed. Like I cannot go anywhere. So I just need to make the best of it and almost get out of this whole flying around the world and just be a normal person. So I remember I went to the movie theaters and Wonder Woman was such a big blockbuster at during in 2017. So I went to the movies and it felt so great to just sit there and be like a normal person eating popcorn. Um, and, and so those things help. So uh, I really hope Zara is, is doing the same. Um, and from her Instagram posts, I think she's making the best of it. So that's, that's great. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah, I think that's great advice. I mean, that's good advice in anything that you're doing is to just have some downtime. So maybe it's a gift and you go back to it refreshed afterwards, right? Very true. Yeah, absolutely. So what have you done since your flight? Tell us about your family, your work, everything that yeah. you've been working on. You know, Liz, so I had spent, as I mentioned to you, five years preparing for the global flight. Um, and a lot of it really was the outreach piece because for me, it was like, it's pointless for me to fly around the world when, if we don't have the outreach in place. Um, so uh, a big part of why we delayed in 2016 was the outreach just wasn't there yet. And so we, um, you know, I, I, there were some people on our team who said the outreach will come if you just take off, people will get excited. And I thought like, I'm not leaving, I'm not taking off if this trip is not going to be meaningful to children around the world. So we took a year to really refine our outreach efforts. And that was all thanks to our partnership with ICAO and all of the delegates from the different countries that I had um, landed in who really pulled together and, and we, we hosted over 32 outreach events around the world. So that was um, kind of the heart of, of it all. I think that's such a, um, a mature decision, you know, and, and probably took a lot of restraint to make that yeah. decision because you've been building up for it for so long. But to have that restraint and to make sure that the planning was in place and that yeah. it was achieving your goals, I think that's right. really impressive. Just just that Thank decision you. alone um, yeah. is a huge, uh, huge accomplishment for you. Yeah. And, and you were able to achieve what you wanted to. But we were talking about, like, uh, I wanted to hear about your family and, like, what oh, happened. Sorry. You did all this preparation yeah. for five years. That was a big yeah, achievement. So, yeah. That's a big achievement <laughs> having that baby boy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about family yeah. and work since then. Yeah. So I had spent five years planning for this trip, and I just felt like my life was so unbalanced. Like, I had lost a lot of communications with my my good friends my family relationships were just you know a text message an email and so I didn't like that I really wanted to just kind of balance my life a little bit better so I took some time off and I I got married I had a baby boy I actually ended up moving overseas to the Middle East and um you know, it, it was just a time for me to unplug, absorb what I had just experienced and focus on the other aspects of life. You know, for me, a career is important, but also family. Like I had grown up wanting to have a family and, you know, that was a big part of my life. So it was interesting how it all kind of came full circle. I found myself you know, um, cooking, you know, just doing the things that I had always wanted to do as a little girl and yet still accomplish this, this trip around the world. Um, so uh, I, I remember at one point, you know, becoming a new mom, I, I just, I felt a little bit overwhelmed being overseas. And 
you know, throughout all this time, I kept asking myself, what's next for me? What do I want to do? And I'm getting older and I want to make sure like whatever I do is really going to make a difference. And it's going to be representative of where I am in my life right now. Um, and so as a new mom, I was listening to a lot of podcasts, just trying to like understand motherhood. Uh, and I just, I, I found a podcast where it gave me a sense of community and it was so great to hear from other moms and what they were doing, their successes, their hardships. And I remember one day thinking to myself, like, gosh, I wish I could have had this in aviation as I was starting, you know, starting out. And there was this big realization in my kitchen where I thought, well, this is my next step. I want to provide a platform for women to have these types of conversations um, so that there is no gray area. Um, so right now, you know, I'm married, I have a baby boy, I uh, am a podcaster, which I never in a million years would have imagined. Um, and I'm building this platform, the Aviate platform for women in aviation to have just more, more of a resource than I did um, so many years ago. Um, and we're also doing a lot of work with our nonprofit Dream Store. So that's where I am right now in my life. And I feel much more balanced and I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Tell us really quickly about Dream Soar. What's its mission and how is it operating? So Dream Soar is the nonprofit that I, I flew around the world under. Um, and, and our mission was to inspire the next generation of STEM and aviation professionals. And kind of the first project that we launched was the global flight, um, where I was able to, we hosted 32 outreach events in 22 countries, and um, we inspired over 3,000 children. That was me getting in front of 3,000 kids around the world and talking to them about careers in STEM and aviation. And post-flight, we visited an additional nine countries, and we hosted, I think it was uh, 33 more outreach events and our impact was over 12,000 kids total. Um, so, you know, outreach is so important, uh, which we've realized and to do it through the global flight and kind of capture the story and share it really resonated with a lot of young kids. And in 2019, right before the pandemic, uh, we were able to provide our first scholarship to a young woman um, at Embry-Riddle. It was a flight scholarship to kind of uh, invest in her, her flying. Um, and so that's what we have done. And, and right now we're, we're really, we've taken some time to think about how can we make a greater impact and how can we grow? And so Dream Store right now uh, really stands on three pillars. And that is the outreach portion of it. Uh, we are building a scholar program and the third pillar is focused on innovation because I think uh, pilots do a great job following you know, the, the, um, the path that's laid out to becoming an airline pilot or military pilot or business aviation, but there's really no room for innovation and creativity. Uh, so we're trying to bring that into aviation. So that's what we're working on. That's what our nonprofit um, is about and you can learn more by visiting dreamsoar.org. And can we contribute to that effort too? Oh, absolutely. Actually, all of the proceeds of the Fly Girl Fly book goes to our nonprofit, um, but it is a nonprofit organization. So any sort of donation that you make online uh, or to the organization is tax deductible and it's just investing into our three pillars that I just shared with you all. Okay, awesome. And then back to the podcast topic. First of all, it's Aviate with Shasta, and Aviate is an acronym. You want to share that with us? Yes. Okay. I hope I can get this all <laughs> in line here. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So A is for acknowledge, um, acknowledging those who are pioneers in our industry, both past and present, because representation matters. Um, v is vocalize. And that's uh, what we do through the podcast is just having women share their experiences, vocalize their thoughts um, and their passions. Um, I is inclusion. We, you know, 
we, we see so much about diversity and inclusion and so much in aviation when you hear about women, you know, it's very narrow. It's always focused on the, the, the selected few that we always hear about. And if you look back, Liz and, and um, Nancy, you two of all people know that there is so much diversity in our industry and we need to be inclusive of them and get their stories out there. Um, so let's see. Then act, that's the second A, um, act on our passions, the things that, ma that matter most to us. OT is travel because it's such a big part of those who are in aviation. It's a big part of our lives. We all have a sense of love for travel. And then E is evolve. Um, what happens when you, you know, become a mother or if you retire or even evolving as, as a, a pilot or a person. Um, so those are the themes that are tied to the AV platform. And we are just getting started. The podcast is just one small piece of this vision that we have that is aviate well after hearing you talk about the inspiration behind the podcast and the importance of that um you know your journey through motherhood inspiring you to do that uh, i'm doubly honored to have been a guest on the show yes. to talk about motherhood which i was like i don't know if i'm qualified to do this <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the opportunity to do that uh, because it was something that, you know, in my career, I felt was very important and I wanted to be a mentor and an example for other women to show them that, yes, you can have a career or pursue your dreams in aviation and have a family. Yeah. There's compromise, of course. And it's right. so helpful to hear the strategies and um, ways in which other women experience that. So thank you so much for creating that platform. Yeah. And you thank you for being a guest. And, yeah. and you know, when we first started our conversation, I, I think I told you this is probably like my favorite conversation to talk about because it was the inspiration for the platform. So I appreciate you sharing your story and insights um, on this topic. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you kicked off the AV8 um, with Shasta podcast in June with an interview with Dr. Seema Samar, the chair of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission. And she yeah. talked about the U.S. It, this was before the withdrawal and she was sort of predicting what the outcome might be. And I listened to that, you know, in preparation for this interview. And it was interesting to hear, um, you know, where she her predictions were accurate and where mm -hmm where there were some unpleasant surprises um, yeah. compared to what she thought might happen. But how do you, how do you feel about the situation in Afghanistan right now? You know, it's very heartbreaking and it's very telling because Dr. Sima works day in, day out with the Afghan people. She lives there. And the fact that she predicted that the Taliban were never going to make it to Kabul um, and sadly, that prediction, you know, um, the, Tal the Taliban did end up going to Kabul and really taking over the entire country. Um, it, it's, it just shows that it was all very unexpected to everybody. And it is very devastating because now a lot of these women know um, about education and the power of it and just being able to have the freedom to walk outside um, without fearing for your life. I mean, there was always a level of fear in Afghanistan, but it's increased dramatically. Um, and, and the fact that the, you have a generation of educated, very smart, very determined women that are expected just to stay home and, and do nothing is, um, it's very hard to digest. And I think the most shocking thing, you know, just, to put everything into perspective, Afghanistan is the only country in the world at this time that denies education to young girls. And that that's just that's just not okay with humanity. We, it's very concerning and you know, it's, it's just it's a very tragic situation. Yeah, we really got so this month the Aviatrix book 
Club is reading Open Skies by Niloufar Rahmani. I, I interview her tomorrow, so I'm excited about that. But we really got a sense in Open Skies by Niloufar Rahmani um, about sort of that experience of being in it because she was a child refugee in Pakistan, came back, her mother was teaching her at home because they weren't allowed to go to school. And then that experience of things opening up enough for her to be educated and have the opportunities. And then, you know, seeing how things, um, even with the opportunities open at the time that she was a pilot, uh, how, the Taliban was still influencing her yeah. life. Um, it was a very, very moving story. Have you, I'm sure you have, but I'd love to hear how um, you have reflected on how your life might have been different uh, if your family hadn't emigrated to the U.S. when you were a child. You know, Liz, um, I think growing up, you know, once my parents realized that we're not going back, I think that they wanted to bring this message and, and make sure that we were aware of it, that we are so lucky to have escaped when we did. Um, and, and that it's, it's, you know, the ultimate, it's the ultimate um, best case scenario for any Afghan family to be in America safe and have the opportunities that we have. Um, and so, yeah, I think about it all the time. And quite honestly, a lot of the work that I do and even getting into aviation and a lot of my strength comes from this sense of duty and the sense of like, you know, if, if I didn't make it out of Afghanistan, and what I would want those who did make it out, what I would want them to do, you know, to, to kind of give back to those who didn't make it out. So I, I've, I've always carried that sense of duty with me. And um, it was very important for me to keep Afghanistan a part of the global flight. And at one point, the insurance providers were like, there's no way you're going into Kabul. Uh, you, you know, you cannot go. It's dangerous. Um, the mountains are pretty high you know, from every angle they saw risk and danger. So, um, you know, I, I just didn't take that as an answer. I, I, I found a different way. So I flew a commercial airliner to Kabul to make sure that Afghanistan was included in this global flight. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's something that I think I lead with above all is the sense of duty of what I would want uh, in my position to have done, you know, being able, fortunate to leave Afghanistan. Um, and when I finished the global flight, I had all these ambitions to go back and start a flight school. And it was so disappointing because year after year, I would get the runaround, I would get big promises that would never turn into anything. And it just gave me another perspective of what it's like for the people and what they've been dealing with. Um, and so I'm very grateful. I'm always going to continue to advocate for Afghanistan. And, you know, I have that that sense of duty close to my heart. And I'm really hoping that things are going to change in the near future. Well, what words of encouragement might you have for the young women in Afghanistan right now? The, the message that I would have for young girls in Afghanistan is just to not give up. Um, you know, the world sees the pain that you are in. And there are a lot of people all over the world that are trying to bring long-term solutions. The Afghan ambassador to the U.S. said it best. And she said that we cannot think of short-term solutions. We need to think long-term solutions for Afghanistan because that's part of why we're in this problem. You know, we cannot think for today or even tomorrow. It's got to be long-term. So I know from my interactions with people, the, the world is aware and they're working hard. So just don't give up. That's, that's just the most important piece. Yeah. I don't even know what to say to that because I yeah. just can't imagine being in that situation. We have so many privileges and reading Nilufar's book really put that into very clear perspective, you know, especially as a woman in aviation, and I'll say this again when I talk to her, I'm sure, just 
you know, we all experience some obstacles or some negativity um, as women in aviation, but it just doesn't even compare to um, her experience or the experiences that the women there are having now. So we will keep them them in our thoughts and um, in any ways that we can support and be active in that, we will do it. Yeah, thank you. How has this book, so we've heard about how the solo trip and all of these things um, have, have impacted your life and hopefully impacted the lives and inspired others, but I'd like to hear specifically from both of you how this specific book has impacted your lives. Nancy, would you like to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, it's been fun, even though like it came out during the pandemic, which is unfortunate that it had you know came out in th- that year, because usually I go to all kinds of book festivals and um, really promote it that way. Everything was canceled, but still it rose to the top, and um, Scholastic picked it up for Rising Voices program. It's a finalist for my state book award, which is you know pretty big deal for. Um, and here in Ohio, it's the Buckeye Children Teens Book Award, and I'm a finalist for that right now. The, the Fly Girl Fly book is fabulous. I'm so okay. excited for you. Well deserved. The kids vote on it too. It's it's a not um, teachers and librarian. The kids vote on it. And something that just happened that Shasta wasn't able to join because she lives in Dubai, so far away. But I got to go to New York, and they did a play based on the book that was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous, Shasta. They had it right on the Hudson River. And they had master dances and every, I read the book, the beginning of the book, and then they would come on stage and dance. Like when you stopped at, you know, um, Afghanistan, they had Afghan dances that were beautiful. I was thinking of your family shots to dance and after dinner, um, do the dances that they were showing me. And they, they went country to country that way you did your stop, not every stop, obviously be too long, but it was a two and a half hour play. And wow. the whole play was based on the book. And I, I had tears in my eyes. I was so heartfelt. I, I was looking like, I can't even believe this is happening, that this beautiful play, um, what they called it, Taking Flight. So that was amazing. And it's supposed to come out with a video of it. So maybe you could get to see it. Um, but you no, know, it's been fun. And it's my first picture book. So for me, it was just such a thrill to see my words in pictures. Um, and I, I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but an author doesn't get to meet the illustrator and we don't even get to communicate. So it was kind of hard. I'd had any communication I had, had to go through the editor. Uh, but when I finally got to meet Alexandra Bai, she was amazing and we had fun. Um, me, Shasta and Alexandra did a book launch together and we got to meet Zoom, how everyone's meeting these days through Zoom. <laughs> um, and she just wrote the, she just illustrated the book about Dr. Anthony Fauci. So yeah. I don't know. If you, Great, I yeah, I saw that. I saw that in her She's illustrated many books and they're beautiful, yeah. Mm-hmm. So this, it's been fun, real fun. And how about for you, Shasta? How has this impacted you? You know, greatly, like now that I have a child, um, I haven't read the book to him in completion yet, um, but I just remember going to the library and, you know, I would have, so would have loved to have a book like this growing up where you hear a story of someone just it completely different. And it's based the way that Nancy wrote it. It was, it's just, it's so much fun yet it's serious and it, it helps just tell the story in, in such a, a light way. Um, and so just having this book and the representation and the message behind it available for young boys and girls, I think is just, I have a sense of like, pride that that this exists and it's there it's available in libraries um so yeah i i think it's it's like i really don't have words it's it's unreal but at the same time i'm just so happy that it's there for young people to know what are the possibilities if you dream i am too i'm so grateful for the book i'm so glad you did it uh, but i'm also curious to know if there's a memoir in your future for you know, <laughs> I, I, there is, um, and you know, it's interesting because I, I thought like, oh, gosh, no, who would want to hear that? Who would want to read that? And <laughs> I do <laughs> and about you know, 1400 other book club members for sure. Yeah. And millions of other people. I think the one thing that really changed my mind was, um, when Jerry Mock completed her trip and 
you know, I read her book, 3-8 Charlie, and it like, it was very inspiring to me. And it just, it opened up my world. It gave me perspective. It, you know, it just, it was just an amazing book. And I thought if Jerry didn't have that book and that, that book is what connected Jerry Mock and I in person, then I probably wouldn't have flown around the world. So, it, you know, having that experience, you know, I just hope that when I do write a book that it will inspire others to just dream big, think outside of the box and, um, and go after the things that they are most passionate about. So it's in the works, it's slowly in the works, but I, I hope to complete a book um, in the near future. So we'll, we'll see where, what happens. <laughs> we will be very excited about that. Thank you. Before we move on to talking more specifically about the craft of the book and how you, that relationship worked between you guys, do you have any last words for the book portion or um, anything that we've talked about so far? You've just, thank you for giving us the opportunity, Liz, um, to, to talk, you know, with Nancy and, and have this time to kind of share the, um, the work that was behind the book and thank you for all that you're doing for um just women in aviation well thank yeah. you nancy it's an important you? thing if women in aviation um it's become my passion because i've seen only six percent right now of all our pilots are women and that's like 2021 that's unbelievable mm -hmm. and so I, mean, I think you touched on a little bit i think a lot of people have a hard time thinking of being a a mom or a wife and being a you know pilot but you know you're both examples that it can work so i think i think get the word out there and um just encourage more women because like shasta said in the book the plane doesn't know if you're a boy or a girl so uh, um why not yeah. follow your dreams well, thank you nancy for being a part of it and projecting being an amplifier for our voices in this <clears> way <throat> and delivering that message to young women you know, it's something that I am passionate about as a writer. I want to write for children and and inspire them to join us in aviation. And you're doing that for us with your book. So thank you so much, Nancy. And just a thank Pleasure. you for your incredible story and sharing it with the world this way. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>